So, uh, good afternoon, Amrita, ma'am. Good afternoon to all the to the coordinators and to my very lovely students. Thank you for joining in. Uh, today we are here to be a part of a very interesting session. Uh, did you all like the photography competition? Did you all enjoy it? You all can just raise. Yes, ma'am. Zoom. Yes, ma'am. Okay, yes, brilliant. Yes, ma'am. So uh, we received overwhelming entries, and I was really happy to see the kind of pictures that you all have submitted. Great work done by all of you. So my many many congratulations. And uh, so this session is going to be very interesting. We have a guest uh, today who is from that field and who is going to be sharing some really insights with all of you on photography. And uh, he is also the judge of the competition, and he has a winner for us. So I am very excited to know the winner because picking out my favorites as you all kept sending me the entries. But I'm very, very eager to know that uh, who is the first of its kind competition that uh, our school held. And uh, I promise that I'm going to make it a ritual and all of you practicing photography because trust me, it is a beautiful art, right? So without any further ado, take this opportunity of welcoming and introducing our guest for today, Mr. Rahul Maheshwari. Rahul, if you can switch on your video, please. Hello, hi. Hi, Rahul. So I will take a quick two minute uh, time for introducing Rahul. Um, you know, bored of the daily office work and the family business, Rahul decided to do what he always wanted to do, a career in the creative field. At 25, while his friends were settling in with jobs and getting married, he decided to trade in everything for a one way ticket to US. Now, amazing. While in design school, Rahul ran into photography by chance. He began his photography career assisting in his college darkroom in exchange for free film roles so that he could shoot with the studio camera. In 2004, he landed up at the National Geographic on an expedition which was headed by senior photo editors and photographers from the National Geographic. In 2005, Rahul's photography journey took a dramatic turn when he was selected to assist the photography legend Steve McCurry at his studio in New York eventually becoming Steve's digital editor. Rahul has assisted workshops with photographers like Raghu Rai, Fritz Hoffman, Luke Townsend, Mixon, Ricardo Cases, and the list is so on and so forth. It's a huge list. Um, Rahul has a bachelor for print and association of arts and TV and film production from Collins College, Tempe, USA. He has also been the communications chair for American Institute of Graphic Artists, Arizona. Rahul is the technical director at Studio Pomegranate, which offers photography and video services at a wide spectrum in Kolkata. He teaches uh, photography at the Calcutta International School to students across grade 6 and 11. Oh, wow, what an impressive dossier that is, Rahul. A welcome from all of us to you, and thank you so much for taking time and being a part of this session. Thank you. Thank you for having me here and a very good afternoon to principal, principal ma'am, all the teachers and all the coordinators and the students from your school. Thank you, Rahul. Uh, we also have a very interesting guest today who is going to be interviewing Mr. Maheshwari. Uh, please uh, welcome Ms. Aradhita Saraf. Hi, Aradhita. You're on mute, Aradhita. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Hi. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. Great, great. So taking this opportunity to also introduce Aradhita. She's the founder at Veloquent, a digital writing center. Additionally, as a digital hygiene trainer with Google News Initiative, she ensures that all content generated from her platform is uh, fact-checked. Aradhita is our content partner and has worked extensively for the school. An avid photographer herself, she will be interviewing Mr. Maheshwari, who was her teacher and getting various insights for all of us. I welcome you, Aradhita, and I'm so looking forward to this session. Thank you, Suganda. It's been a pleasure. Without any further ado, uh, Aradhita, the, the platform is yours, and we are looking forward to this chat show. Thank you. Um, I hope all of the students really enjoyed um, submitting their photographs, experimenting with their cameras, and just trying to you know click photographs um, during the quarantine. I remember when I was younger, and I just got my, I used to use my mother's cell phone to, you know, just click around 
photographs and th- just the sky or maybe when I went out for a walk, anything that I thought was beautiful. So it's um, truly an um, enjoyable experience just playing with your camera. So uh, to, before we waste any time, I'd like to uh, learn from Rahul first more about his journey um, in photography. And I'll start with the question, when did you first realize your passion for photography? So uh, for me, photography happened by chance. It was never the intention because I went to the US to study graphic design. I was always inclined towards design. And that was the intention for the degree. Now, in the curriculum, we had a four week mandatory course in doing basic photography. Uh, the concept was very clear, you know, as a designer, you have to present art concepts. So they said that you should know some basic photography wherein you could click some photos and, you know, make a stronger pitch for your design. So it was during those four weeks that, you know, when I started looking more into photography and when the camera came in my hand and then, you know, I got more uh, exposed to what was happening in the school dark room and the school dark room was massive. I mean, it, I think uh, it had like a 40 feet ceiling and, um, you could drive a car in and you, know, you could shoot automobiles in there. So it was pretty massive setup and just kind of just being around there and seeing all those things that became very fascinating. So that's how I kind of got involved with photography. And then when did you realize or when did you decide to take it up professionally? Like when did it convert from being a passion to a profession? Um, so see, there are a couple of uh, things that happened, I think in sequence that made it very exciting for me. Um, first thing that I think, um, all of you should know is that I, I am a traditionally trained, uh, photographer. I learned on film back in the day when there was no digital, I mean, owning a digital camera was like, it was a dream. You couldn't even think of it. It was so expensive. So I learned on film and, uh, how it got to me was that while helping in the studio, you know, the, the teacher or the professor would say, you know, why don't you help us in the dark room also? So, you know, the whole process of loading the camera to clicking images and then to process it in the dark room with the chemicals and, you know, it, it, I think it takes a lot of time. It was a very organic process, which I really got excited about. So I started looking more and more in the subject. And um, prior to that, till class 12, I had a background in IT. I used to code quite a lot. So, you know, that, that bent of the brain was there. And then suddenly there was this organic art kind of a brain that was working on the side. And then suddenly within a span of one and a half years, everything shifted to digital. So, you know, when that happened, this organic entity just morphed into an online on computer thing. And I already knew my way in and out of computer. So that made even more exciting. Like, you know, wow, you know, we went from here to here and that interim phase was so chaotic that people who were on film, they were struggling to get on the computer. So they needed the transition phase. They needed someone to handhold them. And it just came very easily to me. And to top it all off on the top, what I'd say the cherry is the degree in graphic design because we were being taught how to handle images. So then I knew the organic, I knew how to handle the images and I knew the end goal. So it all fell in place for me. And that's how I just got deeper and deeper in the subject. Wow. Considering your decision to like uh, pursue photography professionally had so much to do with the equipment. What do you think about uh, phone photography nowadays that everybody seems to be practicing and uh, experimenting with? I think uh, phone photography is true democratization of a subject. Um, If you look at it 25 years ago, 40 years ago, photography was only practiced by people who could afford it. Then came the era of, you know, people wanted to get into photography. So it was like, okay, you know, it's a very shady subject. You really don't know what the future is. So very few photographers were around. But I think with phone photography, it's true democratization, uh, you know, democracy in terms of Even the auto rickshaw guy has a, you know, 12 megapixel cell phone. So, (laughs) you know, they have an access and the ability to express themselves creatively. So I think that's really fantastic. Yeah, I think it's a big boon, especially now when we're all quarantined. 
safety and then we but the one thing we do have access to is our phones and so that makes it possible for us to engage in photography so how do you recommend students can practice photography while they're like locking down and in quarantine uh it's a tough one because um now with so many people clicking you know so many um uh, so much content i always now call, call it content i don't call it photos anymore it's just i think it's, it's simpler to call it content is this too much of noise and um, you just need to keep figuring out you know keep clicking some photo here and there till you figure out that you really enjoy this subject and once that goes in you know you just go slow with it it's not going to happen overnight it takes years and years of practice and um that's how it has to be so uh, there's you have to find a difference between clicking and actually creating so creating is when you're actually putting in the effort framing it properly the light and you're you know focusing on everything and then mm-hmm. making a conscious effort of creating an image clicking would be what mm-hmm. you do with your food and with your friends and what not understood i remember when i was doing my class with you you had asked me to like um find uh, letters in my house like just yeah. letter <laughs> s in something that was naturally so that helped me be so much more observant and like click like click all day long so any such uh, like techniques or assignments quick quick uh, tips you might have for students to you know yeah, like uh, just keep an eye out for things they can photograph in and around the house so there are two assignments which i love to give to my students and uh, kind of they hate me for it uh, the first one is when you're looking for the alphabets a through z occurring in shapes around you so they need not necessarily be text like you can't just go and find a alphabet painted on a wall or wherever and say oh this is what it no the shape is what you're looking for right and the more refined the shape you can find and frame the better it comes across so that's you know training your eye to look for things so here you're forcing yeah. to look for things and the other assignment is the 100 thumbnails where you take an object of your choice preferably something small enough that you can move around very easily so i would say something that fits in your hand and you can move around and show me a hundred different ways of looking at that object so you can't have you know each each photo should be different but if i look at the photo i should know oh yeah okay this is a you know like a laptop or this is like a toothbrush or whatever it is so that forces you to look at a subject again with different ways No, because everybody is not getting the same shot. I remember doing both of these exercises and thoroughly yeah. enjoying them. Yeah. So. Um, how important is post-processing a photograph to you? This is a topic that. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> I I think it's a part and parcel. Considering of the game, right? we all use so many filters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So let let's not let's not kid ourselves and let's not try to be too purist i should also not be too preachy about it because i do a lot of post processing on my images because that is what is required but what i always say is um there is a amount of time that you need to put in a project okay and 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 you're being I, and i'm talking completely from a commercial point of view because i think uh, wherever you involve money it makes sense very quickly so if if say for example if my project is supposed to be finished off in 5 hours okay that's the amount of time i should be taking to finish off a project and that's when i make profit in the project um if i don't shoot properly i'll spend hours and hours and hours trying to fix that mistake so you go beyond 5 hours and now you're making a loss in your project so i always say shoot strong and the minor hiccups you clean off in post processing so even today for the commercial work i do for portraits and everything um whatever is being fixed on the camera uh, sorry on the computer is intentional it is known that these are the things i have to fix anything else that need can be fixed during the shoot should be fixed there and you should know what your end goal is then you you know then you justify post processing otherwise you can be hours at ends filter after filter and never be happy <laughs> true true 
Um, so what is the one thing you wish you knew when you started taking photographs as an amateur photographer before, you know, you um, decided to uh, take it up professionally? So I don't know. I think the entire journey has been so, so amusing and so amazing and so exciting for me that I don't, I wouldn't want to go back and change anything. However, I would say that I wished I understood depth of field sooner because it took me six months just to understand what it did. Mm -hmm. So for six months, I would struggle on and on and my teachers would explain it again and again. It just, I don't know, I just couldn't see it. And then one fine day I was like, oh, okay, that's it. So <laughs> those are the six months that I, I, you know, it was just, I don't know, I just didn't get the concept, but it is what it is. Do you think you could explain depth of field in like a sentence or two? Well, now I figure out how, how to explain it easier. Like I figured out, oh, if this was showed to me, then I would do it. So you remember I do the thumb um, exercise where, you know, if you yes. guys put your thumb out like this, and if you bring your thumb closer to your eye, it's about 72 centimeters or something of that where your, you know, your, your nearest vision is going to be. So now what I can do is I can shift focus on my thumb completely. And I see everything on my thumb, but you see everything behind gets blurred out and that's depth of field. Being able to control where the blur comes, that's depth of field. Thank you for that. That, that was very helpful. Wow, I know that, that was really super. <laughs> so, like I said, you know. It's... I'm just trying to figure it out how though. <laughs> it's Why like your eye I mean, becomes the camera and then you yeah. just try to, yeah. Your iris contracts and the focus kind of comes in front. So that's how it works. I'll try it offline, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, uh, any uh, particular magazines, books or videos or any like freely available resources on the internet you think you recommend students to like uh, go through to hone their photography skills? Yeah, YouTube. Okay. <laughs> you know that i mean that's the that's the best and the worst place to be on because you find everything in there definitely um look for the right people look for the right, right content creator and why i say youtube because you get everything you know if you're lazy like me i can't read i mean for the love of god i really can't read but if it's content if it's audio and visual it's easy for me to you know grasp it so any specific creators you recommend um See, uh, it depends uh, what level you're at. So if you're at the basic foundation, then look for people who are right there. So I wouldn't uh, know the basic guys, but the kind of stuff, the kind of people I follow are doing high end retouching or, you know, they are mm -hmm. mostly discussing photography. Mm -hmm. One very good channel though, I would say is the art of photography. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, another person who you could look for uh, retouching and all that kind of stuff is uh, Pratik Nayak. He's one of the best in the world and it's okay. very nice uh, to look at his uh, content. Thank you. Thank you. I'm making a note of that myself. I'll, I'll um, tell you. <laughs> uh, okay. And I think just a couple more questions and then we can move on to like the results, which everybody's eagerly awaiting. Sure. Which would be your favorite lens? I'm just curious. Uh, Maybe so currently. Currently, yeah. So it's evolved over a period of time. Currently, I think I'm in love with the 35 millimeter lens because um, the 35 millimeter lens is absolute field of view for the human eyes. So when you end up photography, you know, when you end up making content with it, it is exactly the way a human eye would see it. So the, the width and the height and the distortion, whatever it is there is there. And um, I love using prime lenses because you can't zoom in and zoom out standing in one place. So what happens is you're forced. So if you want to zoom in, you have to move closer. If you have to zoom out, you have to move away. So that forces you to move around. And I think that is what is very important with photography. Very true. I've used that lens before and yes, I've thoroughly enjoyed myself. Yeah. Um, okay. And now just before we go into the results, what are some key pointers that you think make a good photograph? Like when you look at a photograph, what, what makes you think, okay, this is a good one? What's one, what about it makes it stand out? Um, so see, there's one very simple answer for it. The simplest answer and the most, um, you know, I think accurate answer in my opinion is the fact that art is subjective. You know, mm -hmm. photography is a 
means of art and it's a perfect union of mechanical and art so art is subjective so as the sooner all of us accept that fact it becomes easy to accept the result because what you like on instagram i may not like it and what the students are currently hashtagging and you know hitting like on we might not you know see eye to eye with it mm-hmm. so um find out you know what you enjoy and that kind of works that way but i think at the same time you have to be very aware of who you're creating the content for if you're creating it for a larger audience then please cater to what they want mm-hmm. you know the kind of portraits i do i enjoy it i find it very you know i find it very nice but it doesn't really do well with a lot of people at large they don't see what i see in it and therefore that kind of work is not as appreciated as the kind of work that you know consumers want so they want something i do it for them because they want it they need it would i do it if i had the choice like would you if you told me you know choose between a and b would i give you a i would not because i prefer this mm-hmm. so you know who you create content for and it should meet their needs that's the best way to explain it thank you i think now we can move i just have one question uh, okay. two actually um firstly you know more technical so what do you think about this new thing you know this drone photography i mean you know that's is do you think that is actually human intervention where we see the you know what's capturing by, by, and or do you think it's just one of the technology used for aerial shots what do you what do you feel about this entire uh, concept of drone photography see drone photography drone is just a tool okay it's yeah. just a tool of getting a shot from an angle or from a perspective that humanly is either difficult or impossible to do it right that said um you know to answer your first part of the question you know the human intervention of course so uh, uh, i have worked with a drone photographer of two categories one is a drone operator and one is a drone operator who knows photography so a drone operator will just fly the drone this way this way wherever you want them to fly they'll fly, fly and they'll keep the drone there and that's it beyond that the camera is just pointing down really not much is happening but a cinematographer or a drone uh, photographer who knows something about photography they fly with the intention of creating the shot in a certain way and that is where the creativity comes so if you see you know the the drone footage that just makes you go like wow Mm-hmm. that's because the person either operating the drone or operating the camera knows what is going on so and yeah it is a difference shot. huge difference in operating it and actually taking photographs with it they yeah, look even i know how to drive a car and so does yeah. michael kumaka and you know <laughs> who belongs on the track <laughs> true true another question rahul uh, you know i mean what like you photography on films and you know even when i was younger we always so you know the picnic that we went to and we would take pictures and then we we would wait for weeks before the films got developed and come back to us so that excitement was kind of there you know we, i would wait for my birthday pictures because you know it's not immediate gratification it's not acha ye acha nahi aaya okay let's delete this and look for a better shot so uh, do you think that you know the generation today is missing out on that excitement or do you feel that you know way to go technology and that's the better way what do you what how do you compare the two so i i think you said the you used a very important keyword while you were asking this question you said gratification and and today's generation is all about instant gratification you know you want it now and and the gratification bit of it is actually in all the areas you know all of us are locked down at home and all of us are ordering food through swiggy you know you press a button and the food is there now yeah so that said this is how things are trending this is how things are moving yes this generation does miss out they don't know what it means of um you know having an uh, made some images and waiting maybe a week before it comes back and you know the excitement of seeing and reliving those moments and because it was so small in number when i say small because you could shoot only so much and the reason was because there was a financial aspect to it every roll of film would cost you money yes so you would only you would only shoot what you were sure of you wouldn't waste yeah but in digital it doesn't really matter and um, yeah. 
I use film as an example of telling people who come to me and tell me, you know, I just want to learn, you know, I just want to learn and I, I'll give whatever it takes to be good at it. And, you know, I tell them if you, the, the best way to, and the fastest way to learn photography is shoot film. You learn in three, in three months because the cost is so much, you know, the, the, the mechanics, the processing, the time consumed, and you make a mistake once, like uh, I used to make a mistake. It's out of focus. I made a mistake that happened on two rolls of film. After that, I never made the mistake because that was, you know, almost $50 down the drain. So after that, every frame I would check and double check and triple check to make sure the focus was correct before I click. Yeah. So that's how it works out. Gets you to be a little bit more cautious and responsible. Yeah, sure. Little yeah. more involved. I think a little more involved is involved yeah. is the right word for it. You you're you're quite involved in the process, and you know your your brain is uh, it in the process. It's not thinking of food and clicking away to glory. So. <laughs> Do you think that, uh, you know, because like you said, we are, it's just digital, easily available to us, uh, somewhere, you know, the aesthetics behind a good photograph, uh, do they get compromised when we, because it's disposable, I mean, I just go with my phone, click, 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 uh, even nature photography, for example, I mean, you know, some days the sky is so beautiful and I really want to capture a nice shot. But then again, because it's so easily available to me, I might just go, you know, five clicks randomly. So aesthetics in photography, how do you rate that? It's very important. And, and um, I, um, there's a very good movie, um, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty or Mitty or whatever it, I think that movie is called. And the ending yeah, is phenomenal. You know, the, the, the last, I think, five, ten minutes where he finds the person he's looking for. And this guy's hunting for a snow leopard in the Himalayas for, I don't know, for ages. And then he eventually sees the snow leopard and he then doesn't click. And then he gives an explanation for it. And, you know, that explanation, I think, is gold. So uh, if, if students can get a hand on the movie, they should look it up. And um, basically, you know, you have to stop to enjoy. So what people uh, in my family expect me to do is, since I, I have my camera with me, wherever we go, they expect me to be clicking like a madman. But that was when I was a student. That was when, you know, I was at whole high of clicking, creating content. But, you know, I think it's with age and wisdom, not that I'm very wise, but what I'm trying to say is that I'm wiser than what I was. With wisdom, what happens is you come to a point where, you know, if I see a beautiful sunset, I probably will not click. I'll just kind of put the camera down and I'll stand and I'll, you know, breathe and I'll enjoy the moment. And then if I'm happy with living that moment, then I'll click. So once you start oh. doing that, you appreciate things more and you find value in little things. Sure. Wow. I think, yeah, that's, that's a beautiful thought. Yeah. So yes, I think it's very important to live the moments, everybody. And, uh, you know, all of you budding photographers, like uh, Mr. Maheshwari said, you know, we need to first absorb the moment and then you all go click, click, click and uh, put up those pictures on, the, on your Instagrams and your Facebooks. Um, so uh, one, one thing I'd just like to add to that, I just remembered um, uh, when I was at the National Geographic Expedition, you know, when I was being trained by these photographers at National Geographic, I was just a college student. So, you know, keeping that in perspective, I had no clue what was going on. They just called me and I never saw what they saw in my work then. But now if I look back at my old work, I understand why they, you know, handpicked. So when you talk about it, it was a nine day boot camp and we talk about it and they would say things like, you know, don't just land up in a place and jump around and start clicking like a madman, you know, just sit for some time, observe, see what is going on. You know, some of them even said things which I laughed at before they said, you know, smell the air, you know, hear the sounds, close your eyes and, you know, let that, you know, get immersed in the situation is what they would say. And that makes more sense now than it made sense then. So, you know, wherever you go, just, pause and observe what's going on because you might be chasing something which is no story at all where the real story would be somewhere else. So yeah. that's what I think is critical to learn. Wonderful, wonderful. 
All right. So Rahul, do you think uh, we can move on to the results and then have a Q and A with the students? I'm sure they have uh, questions to ask you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's do that. Let's go with the. Uh, I think uh, if we can go with the special mentions from top down, and then the winner in the end. Yes. So, uh, students, we actually have a winner, and we have a couple of special mentions, uh, and uh, those uh, that, that feedback is going to be given to us by Mr. Maheshwari here. Let me just quickly share my screen so that we can just take you all through the selected pictures. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Give me a thumbs yes. up. Yes, ma'am. Okay, brilliant. So, Rahul, we move on to the first special mention. Yeah. All right. Um, I I like Shamiksha's image quite a lot, and um, so I'm gonna say a couple of things. Uh, uh, please understand. I mentioned that you know, it's very subjective. So all the decisions are based on my understanding and my opinions. That doesn't mean that those who are not on the list have lost out or they don't know photography. It's just that. at that moment at that brief whichever did better is the one that is here um i like samiksha's image um because uh, i personally believe uh, that um, you know what is very important with the image is an appropriate caption and the caption is what becomes very powerful so it it gets the photographer's message across very easily so her explanation of um you know what the concept behind the photo is i really like that and um i think um uh, that for me sums up a complete image you know a good visual with a good explanation which is not too long and not too short either wonderful congratulations samiksha moving on to the other one uh neel saxena all right so by the very first look i just you know glance through this image uh, when i was going through it i just browsed through it a couple of times through the presentation and this one always i just kind of okay next 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 and then when i came back to it i realized that you know what is actually a portrait so i shoot a lot of portraits um, and uh, it's the face which is the identity of the person and that tells you a lot more about the human being than anything ever will but given the way that the pandemic is going right now this is what the identity has become for everyone that you see walking on the street you don't know if they're smiling or if they're frowning you know if if they're smiling or they're sad or whatever it is and this is the status quo you know i think globally so i thought that this um was a very unique and a very you know appropriate portrait for the current time right uh rahul i couldn't help notice that this picture has you know a sort of i mean there's some texture to the uh you know to the head and so it's like a shadow effect or something yeah it looks like a, a two shadows or like three layers so some kind yeah. of uh, i don't know post processing glitch or whatever i couldn't figure it out what it was or it's been cut out from some background or something i figured had happened but i didn't think too much about it okay okay all right next Ah, Suhani's image was uh, uh, this one made me smile because I am a very firm believer of the fact that you know there's a child in every one of us. It's just that as you grow older, you ask the child to shut up more often. You don't let the child <laughs> do what the child does. Um, and um, this seemed like you know a mirror image, like kind of looking inside, outside. And she calls it soulmates. So for me, it felt like you know being in touch with your inner self. And it also kind of. Uh, made me think about you know my favorite uh, cartoon character bill watson's calvin and hobbes where hobbes <laughs> is just a fragment of his imagination yeah it just feels like here's a real person and here's a imagination of hers which is her soulmate so that's how i i interpret this wonderful ria's image this is the i think this is the only image in the entire um, selection which uh, you know uh, artificial light has been used and uh, uh in terms of artificial light is being used to light up the entire uh, portrait there is no other light it's just the rice lights that are creating uh, the light and uh, without light you can't have uh, photography so i found this unique this kind of stuck out and that's why i uh, went with this one awesome 
stands in. All right, so this is a very interesting uh, observation that uh, Tenzin makes about uh, portrait. Okay, she says that the concept behind the portrait is sightless. Its main objective is to explore self-expression through uh, movement without sight. This is, you know, I, I don't know. It's it's a topic of very long discussions, and um, it made me think. And then the visual kind of, you know, plays along with that whole sightless. Uh, factor so uh, interesting because uh, if you see how her hands are sticking out it almost seems like she's trying to explore what is around her while being sightless so it kind of played very well i agree i think it's a very interesting image beautifully captured all right so that's shoyash uh, and um, this was i think uh, a very wonderful point of view for him to click uh, get this photo click yeah and i view interesting and uh, i think there's a lot of uh, balance uh, in the photograph you know on the left on the right almost looks like a mirror image yes Same with Muskan, you know the way this is a perspective that, uh, which I think matches along with Shuyash's. You know, this is a kind of view that none of the students have shown, and you know, just kind of arching back completely and uh, you know looking into the camera. So it's just the perspective and the point of view which made it stick out, and I thought it should be a special mention because nobody else has done it. Wonderful. Okay, so the, I think there are two or three of these in line. There's Anika and um, there yes, and there's Shweta. That's right, Anika and Shweta. And and I have to give it to these ladies. You know, it takes a lot of effort to dress up and get clicked. You know, <laughs> uh, being given a theme and then actually taking the time and effort to you know uh, what we call in our language, you know, wardrobe up. You know. Going out of the way, choosing your wardrobe, and you know, putting in the effort. You know, like uh, if you see Shweta's, there's a lot of props: the thali with the dia, you know, the the flame being lit on it, the flowers. You know, all these little minor details, the hair, the flower on her hair. You know, these minor details that she's taken care of to, you know, get there. This, I think, uh, it's it's really interesting that at this age, you're putting in that effort to you know participate in a school competition. That's that's very nice. That's that's really nice. I read this is really enjoyable. Awesome. All right. So then we have Pratyush, and after Pratyush, we have I think uh, Shruti. So for both of them, what I'd say is that your photos actually tell me a lot more than you will ever tell me about yourself. And <laughs> um, by looking at your photographs, I can make a fair. uh guess about what your immediate future plans are and what are the things that influence you in your life um these are very evident by the books that are lying in front of you or the books you've used as props you know uh, here is someone who's uh, you know inclined towards uh, stem but at the same time is um, you know being influenced by uh, our past president or uh, i forget the name of the author on the extreme right hand side but i know he's a spiritual guide and then there are books that suggest that she might be taking a jee exam but then there's also sherlock holmes involved in it so quite a fascinating insight in this young mind um, is what i get from this picture i hope this is true and this is not a make believe <laughs> <laughs> and uh, pratish also if you see you know there's chairs there's nelson mandela and uh, jataka tales are there which i fondly remember from my childhood yeah so um you know these are things which when you look at a photograph you can tell a lot more by the surroundings and uh, once you start doing this once you start picking up on a photograph and seeing things and you know you can tell a lot more about the person um these two in particular you know there's so much information in the images that I actually stopped and I actually went through it in details to you know amuse myself and I was like, oh okay this is interesting or oh, very fascinating you know so uh, these two were um uh what really stuck out awesome okay and now we have the winner so all you guys excited <laughs> all right so uh 
Rahul, I am going to be announcing the winner, and then we'll think to hear from you. Why is this particular entry the winner? So here I go. All right, congratulations, Asta. Congratulations! A huge round of applause, everybody! Come on. Is Asta here? Uh, is she is she a part of this session, Asta? All right. All right, Rahul, waiting to hear from you. Okay, so um, you know, the theme is fighting my inner demons, and uh, I saw this image maybe twice or three eyes, and then I, you know, what I do is I usually walk away from the image, and then, you know, I'll go take a walk or whatever, I'll do my stuff, and then I'll come back again, and then I'll look at it again because you don't want, you know, that instant, oh wow, you know, just jump the gun and kind of do it, and I, and I kept coming back to this image, and what this works it works on so many levels and it's just a beautiful image because uh, first of all there's a wonderful play of the light over here okay the light and shadow they go hand in hand to build the image without the shadow if you remove the complete shadow it's a useless image if you remove the light on asta's face it is an absolute useless image it's just going to be looking like a blob of either white or either black so without each the photo is absolutely um, not working and um, you know whatever prop she's used, it just works wonderfully well, and it fits in with the message which she says, "Fighting my inner demons." Um, because I think in day-to-day -day life, the scale of good versus bad is always that balance is always on the tilt, and um, more often than not, we find that in you know the bad is winning over the good, or there's more bad influences out there. So the shadow is bigger than what the white area is. White being good and shadow being dark and bad. And uh, kind of if you see the shadow on top, it looks like the head has got like kind of a crown or like kind of a, you know, horns of that sort. Yeah. Because those two circular elements, however she's got it there, they kind of gave it that shape of the horn. So yeah. it just kind of, I thought this worked very well. You know, the whole um, uh, coming together of the the drama and that's why I, I kind of uh, went for this image and it's a beautiful photograph each yeah. each and every one of the ones that we've you've presented have been beautiful yeah. so and, and not to say you know the other students uh, they haven't uh, put in their effort in it yes you have and you know uh, but at the end of the day there's got to be you know one winner so yeah I agree. I think all the students, uh, whoever sent their entries, they had some really good pictures. And uh, yes, like Rahul said, at the end of the day, there's one winner. But I'm so glad that Rahul has actually given us special mentions. So I'll be very, uh, you know, happy to send you out your certificates and your goodies and uh, you know whatever we can do to just encourage you to keep, uh, you know, uh, practicing this uh, art. It, it's a beautiful uh, art, and uh, thank you, Rahul, for picking out these special mentions and winners for that. Um, I would now like to open the floor for uh, Q&A with the students. Yeah, please. That'd be great. So, uh, students, I mean, if you all have any questions, you all can raise your hand on Zoom. And uh, I'm sure Rahul would be very happy to answer them. Please don't be shy and you all can ask questions if you all want to. Yeah, I mean, if you guys have another Discord going on, I'm happy to join that also. So, you know, <laughs> discussion there. So, I have a question on chat. Um, uh, one of the students who says that can we organize a landscape photography uh, competition? So, Rahul, do you want to talk about landscape photography and how do you think you know if you organize what sort of photographs and how do the how can children just give them a little inputs on how they can do a uh, see, landscape photography is, uh, it's, I think uh, for me, it, it, it is just, is, you know, the, uh, the urban, so the question, for example, what kind of landscape are you talking about? Are you talking about ur urban landscape or a natural landscape? So I put these two uh, main classification, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, natural would be the natural world where you try to find beauty and awe in the natural world without going there and fixing anything. And urban would be what you see that humans have created and what is left over mostly. 
So you pick and choose which one works for you and then you go from that point of view and you click. And um, what I think what works, what doesn't work is very difficult to say because uh, for the longest time, I don't know if you guys remember, Windows had this landscape uh, wallpaper, I think it was a couple of years ago. Yeah. And for the longest yeah. time, I thought it was a computer generated or a fixed photograph. But it turns out it was a photograph by an amateur photographer, which Microsoft saw somewhere and they liked it so much that they bought the rights or perpetual wow. right of the photograph from that person. So anybody can do it. And there are people who create phenomenal landscape photographs, you know, but um, it can happen only in one way. And, you know, this is going to come back again to what Suganda and I were uh, talking about a little while back you have to stop and observe first. So landscape photography, I think, is um, for people who can, uh, you know, in the chaotic thing happening around you, you can stop and pause and you can identify that one particular small chunk of area in your field of view and then, you know, close in and frame properly with the lens and then figure out the appropriate time for the light or whatever it is and then click it in a way where, you know, no one has ever seen before. So landscape is tough. I think it's one of the toughest because uh, you're out there alone. So if you like yes. being alone, great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, there is another question on chat. Students, you all can ask the questions directly uh, to sir rather than... Yeah, actually, please. I think I'd, I'd prefer if you speak out. That, that makes it a little better. Uh, right now, what I see is just four faces and a lot of text. Yeah, I think, why don't you all just switch on your videos? Aaron, you have questions, switch on your video. Manan, do you have a question? Switch on your video. Just switch on your videos, everybody. Yes, please ask questions rather than putting it on chat. Though there is one student who has asked, uh, the, oh, that's Aaron only. He gets scared, you know, he gets uh, worried that if he's doing photography and, you know, he's taking a picture of a bird and that will fly away. So is fear and anxiety a part of photography? <laughs> so what's your question, Aaron? Oh, like um, how you had talked about before about the focus. So like if um, how you give an example of uh, using a film. So when the focus goes a bit aside and then your hard work is gone. Uh, so it same happens with me when I'm using my DSLR camera. Like you certainly find a unique bird and you want to click a photo. And when you actually review the photo, it's like a blur and, or the fo focus has gone somewhere else. So the problem is like you, you said, uh, yeah, I tried so much, but still I didn't get. And then when you actually go and um, take another photo, the bird is like gone. You don't have anything left. Okay. So that is one uh, problem which I face. Okay. So two issues you're having. One is uh, stop reviewing your photos. Um, uh, in between clicks, you know, you said you click, you find it out of focus, then you go back and the bird is gone. That happens because you stop to review your images while you're clicking. Don't do that. Uh, sudden movements, birds get afraid, you know, animals get afraid, they run away. Um, it's not in focus. Uh, would you believe that I still shoot and I still get shots out of focus? It's a part and parcel of the game. Um, one quick tip that I can give you for bird photography is if you look at the, the body of the bird, if the bird is completely relaxed, you'll find that they have fluffed up and the feathers will be flying or loose. That bird, you can approach, if you approach slowly, I'm not saying you rush towards it. If you approach carefully and slowly, that bird will give you a chance to come pretty close. But if the body is streamlined and the feathers are absolutely streamlined, that means it's tensed, it's gonna fly off any moment. So with birding, you really have to go slow, like snails pace to reach up. So that should, I think that should help you a little bit. And um, also I had another question. So um, you must have used a lot of cameras uh, throughout your uh, journey. So uh, which is your favorite camera like to use? My favorite camera is the Mamiya. It's a medium format film camera. It's a Mamiya RD67. It's about this big. It weighs about four and a half kgs. It's only film and you can shoot only 10 shots per roll. So I like it because so much is involved in creating the image. You know, it takes you an effort to frame it. Then once you're done framing, you have to remove a door at the back before you can click it. Because if you don't remove the door, you can't take the shot. 
and it's 4 kg so you can't sling it around your shoulder and like run around so you have to like stand it you have to prepare it and that whole process i think it makes it very important that you know what you're shooting uh so i had another question yes manan uh so what will be the uh, appropriate age for the photography like for starting a, a career in photography um you know uh, publication uh, public uh, publication of content is super easy in today's day and age anybody can create content and i'm sure you have an instagram page right yeah okay so you already publishing so that that hurdle is gone that means you can put your content out there and people can notice you so just put content out there there is no age for putting content out as far as a professional career is concerned um i feel that you should have some sort of a degree or the other because that little bit of formal training saves you from making a lot of mistake in the early stages and i think it's better that you learn to make the mistakes in school rather than do it in real life so that's there and you can start whenever you want i don't see that age is a factor for anything in today's day and age so you have worked so many places and you know with so many people i just wanted to ask uh, in uh, in so in the photography institutions what is the right age at which they take your entries or they take your admission in so i think every every college depending on which part of the world you apply in they have a minimum requirement class 12 uh, degree or whatever the basic degrees are that is a requirement um though however i would like to point out before you you know think about uh, you're in the ninth grade so you got three more years to go before you can worry about um, getting into a college and in three years the uh, photography uh, industry could go anywhere i've seen a change in the last 15 years and every time there has been a change that change has been in quicker successions last change happened about 3 uh, years ago when all dslrs went went obsolete and everyone went to mirrorless so so i wanted to ask a question yes manvi yeah so what kind of photos do you click i mean do you click landscapes do you click photos of people do you click um, you know about uh, photos of birds or something like that like which kind of photo do you click uh personally or for my bread and butter okay and do because you- why ask the question is if you asking me what do i do for a living i am a photographer for a living so i have to i classify my photography in two broad classifications one is bread and butter and one is milk and honey uh, bread and butter is what i have to shoot to keep the clients happy and they pay me so i can you know have a comfortable life and milk and honey is the subjects and the projects i thoroughly enjoy and i put you know extra effort and extra heart and soul in it and the output is what makes me happy it may not necessarily make all the clients happy okay so milk and honey i think is what i would like to know manvi please go on <laughs> yeah so um are you on instagram facebook or something so that we uh, like you know we can follow you and we can see your uh, photography content i mean do you post pictures of your photography on uh, so um, rahul who what you see in my id right now you know at rahul who anywhere facebook.com/rahul who linkedin.com/rahul who rahul who.com instagram rahul who twitter rahul who everywhere rahul who is going to be me that's my branding that i've done and um I don't post as much as most people do, um, because, like I said, you know, I I think um, it, it's just that the way I've been trained, I've been trained on film. So for me, I can't. I don't think every image which I've created every day is worth putting up on Instagram. It is, you know, after so many shots, you take one photo, which is the final photo, then you clean it up and you prep it, and that is the one photo which you should put up. So I post photos, but not as often. as everyone would think i do but um yeah i do put up photos i do put up content and uh, i do interact with people online thank you thank you so much sorry you have a question i have a question yeah, topic go on yes so i wanted to ask you that how was your experience at national job as you said you worked in national geographic how was your experience so, so uh, i didn't i didn't work with national geographic it was an on expedition series which is where the national geographic folks they hand pick 
who they think is you know good or promising for the uh, for the you know for the photography journey and um for well, the experience was uh, the it was a nine day boot camp and a boot camp is like you wake up photography and you go to sleep photography and in between everything is photography and it was the first three days was very painful because i was literally sitting in the hotel room and crying and like where have i landed up like why am i even here because you have to understand the expectations of the folks of national geographic they're the best in the world so the expectation is nothing less than the best in the world and you can't go and say oh i didn't shoot because i didn't get a shot that's like i think the stupidest uh, excuse that i was trying to sell them that i went out but i couldn't get any you can't tell those people that there's nothing out there because they know better than anyone else so it was iron fist and iron glove that is what it was but um, now i i really value that whole experience because what i've learned there i don't think anywhere i could have learned that and one more uh, were you intimidated uh, intimidated by senior photographers yeah you do feel scared i mean it is it's natural you know because you're uh, some photographers you're in awe of you're like oh my god like you know just I, i've been around a couple of photographers but i just couldn't speak because i was just in so awe of being in the same room with them i was just like wow you know here is this person who you know i really like and he's standing right and you're just like so shell shock and some photographers you are intimidated because it just i think it's a personal i don't know i mean whether it's right or wrong i think it's the the way a individual behaves or projects themselves is either you feel scared enough that okay you know you're so scared you don't want to go and talk to them or they are very warm and very easy to talk to those kind of people you can walk up and talk to so you meet all kinds of people out there and one last question uh what what was your biggest challenge that you faced while working there working with the folks at national geographic or yeah uh, working with uh, other people or with the seniors so so the oh my god they, they look i'll tell you what they just cannot talk some of, i'd say most of the people who i really enjoyed working with and where i've really learned a lot they just cannot talk about anything else it's just it's not in them they're not I, it's i don't know their brain has only one thing it's photography everything connects to photography you just cannot have any other conversation with them and they could wake up at 5 in the morning and they could be at it till 1 at night and then next morning again they could wake up at 5 in the morning and again you know do the same routine so you have to have that energy to you know step up to them and it's only then do you start getting the real uh, input from them Okay thank you sir You're welcome So I think there was one more question or uh, someone else was saying Yes something. sir Yeah Anika tell me Yeah I had a question so is there like a particular thing or object that you that is your favorite that you like to click pictures of People I I I I click photos of people and and I really enjoy it because um uh, uh you know i i get to interact with so many people everywhere i go and it just it's 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 very interesting so it's do really you click cool. pictures of random people yeah random Where people so you know just to share with you you know it's very difficult to click people it seems very easy but i think it's far more difficult because um when i walk around in the city or wherever if i my intention is that that day i'm going to click photos i have nothing on me but just my camera and maybe a you know a hand towel or something and i don't carry anything with me i am very very average dressed i'd probably be wearing slippers or sandals and i try to fit in with the crowd and i can assure you there's definitely no deo or perfume going on that day um because when you approach people and when you want to talk to them and my 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 goal is very simple i have to make friends with someone break ice convince them to let me click their photograph and once i get the photograph i want i'm just going to walk away walk away in terms of like thanks and i'm done and that's my my job is my purpose is served so to do that you can't be you know smelling of bio and you know dressed all fancy they'll see you from a mile away and they like of course i'm not going to talk to this guy so you really got to get down to their level and break ice with them 
some people are very kind you know they offer you food they're eating and obviously you don't want to say no because once that offering starts that means you're going to get a lot more things so a lot more things in terms of not food but thank you for that yes. yeah who is this uh chat disabled who oh. just stop your screen sharing shubham hello sir yes hello um, yeah uh, so uh, sir can you tell me about uh, selective color photography oh uh, when you isolate a photograph and do photographs on it yeah uh, what, what do you want to ask so uh, i have a nikon d5200 So, oh, so you it has a, when you select from there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it has a selective color mode, but uh, whenever I click, it comes in a gray scale only. Uh, so, and I look. I I don't know how to use that particular model. What I would say is the camera manual that comes with it. If you go through it, you'll get everything. And um, if you feel that it's still not answering your question, just do a YouTube search, and I'm sure you'll find somebody. who has created the content on how to do it and it'll answer all your questions okay cool thank you sir thank thank you for all those uh, answers rahul i me. learned a lot uh sir exactly Just... what is it you want to say with your photographs and how do you actually get your photographs to do that what do i want to say so see i i don't think uh, i am a, i don't think i'm a, a journalist so my photos are not going to highlight a particular topic or a story um i'm very clear uh, what i want to do i like to do headshots and you know all the other work that come along with it uh, however uh, with the ongoing trend i do get asked to shoot some weddings and uh, what me and my team do is we kind of limit to a small wedding we don't go for a very large scale wedding uh, primarily because our approach to the wedding photography is very different we kind of do a narrative where you know it's a go with the flow and the story as it is there are no post shots so in situations like that i just try to do a very narrative kind of thing where every frame is telling a story of what is going to happen or what just happened and i think that is the way i would put my work at and what motivates you know uh, motivates you to continually taking pictures like is it economically politically intellectually or emotionally you know attached to the subject it's intellectual and emotional there is no uh, financial element to there is no political element to it um, because the moment you add a political element to it then you are biased the moment you add a financial element to it then again you're not being true to yourself you're going to end up clicking just because there's a financial angle to it uh, from a knowledge perspective and for a from a intellectual perspective that is what keeps me going so Uh, I have a last question. Two more questions. Is that fine if I ask you? Yeah, yeah, go for it. I mean, I have all the time. I, mean, uh, I can go out. Sir, if you could just suggest uh, a few major points or elements that you would include to make your photography a little more look professional and beautiful. Um, Manan, right? Yeah. Okay, so it's it's very easy, Manan. Uh, uh are you sure you want to do this because i i'm going to tell you a way to do it and i'm sure you want to do this because it will make you a better photographer just you have to do it if you want to do it apart from editing how do you you know get the perfect shot that you need yeah that's what i'm telling you i'm asking you I, i'll tell you a way are you sure you want to do it yeah you sure you can share it uh, you can share the points because even i have had the same question in my mind okay the best way to get good at your photography is keep shooting what you guys need to do is for the next um say 100 days just create 10 photos every day 10 unique different photos every day and once you're done with those 1000 photos delete all of them and then start shooting and see what happens thank you sir you welcome Sir, so like I wanted to ask that um, how did you like uh get started in your career? Like, how did you know that you wanted to be a photographer? So I was just you know being at the workshop where I when I came back I met people at the workshop. They asked me what I do. I told them this is what I do. You know I'm, I'm 
going to design school. I understand this, my background is scoring. And then Steve said, why don't you come and work with me in my studio? Because I need someone like you who understands, um, you know, digital and can take my assets and make it digitize it. So when I started working with him, when I started meeting all these photographers in New York, I realized everyone was, you know, going through the same problem that, you know, struggling to go from photography to digital. And that got me more interested in the subject. And over a period of time, you know, you have to choose what you want to do, what you really enjoy. So it was either graphic design or photography. And I found myself, uh, you know, sleeping better if I was doing photography. So I, I could sleep well. So I chose photography. So uh, I have a last question if I can ask because, you know, uh, time matters a lot. Go for it. Yeah, thank you. So uh, it, we say that every picture has a story behind it. So do you believe in this? And if yes, what is your, you know, what is your experience in life that, okay, I have a story behind this picture and I remember, you have remembered that photo forever. Every picture has a story behind it if it is told well. And the only way you can tell story with a photograph is if your frame is appropriate. So if you, as a photographer, if you put in the effort to, you know, capture the image properly and, you know, help, um, you know, project the message, it works. Like, for example, there's one photograph in the um, competition. I think it's the last slide of this student playing the tabla. And um, I wish that there was more motion blur in that image. There is motion blur on his head. You know, when he's bringing his head to the, I think over his right shoulder, there's a little motion blur on this side. And I really wish that there was more motion blur either in his hands or in his body. And that would, you know, really project the image that he's completely immersed in playing the tabla. So while it does send the image across that, yes, this particular, you know, person is playing the tabla, but a frozen motion is not doing it for me. You know, that's where I think is the, one of the nicest examples I could give you that you all could relate to, you know, that you just needed that little motion that just a little more to convince me that he was actually, you know, involved in the whole process, though he, he, I'm sure he was, it's just that wrong shutter speed. So that decision, you know, these little things that help you, uh, send your message across, um, you know, to everyone. Uh, sir, I had another question. Like, um, nowadays cutting down of trees is a more, um, issue. So like, if you want to take pictures of, trees and show them like how trees look so wonderful and all so like but you don't get the right picture at the right moment like uh suppose it's raining and then there's a dew drop on the on a leaf but then i'm not able to get the right picture at the right moment so like it just falls down due to the way so like how do you get the picture so you want particularly a photo for dew drop on leaves or a plant or something of that sort yeah, like even birds sitting on trees or like mainly my main thing is trees because right. so two different two different subjects or two different lenses. So I'm not going to get too in depth in it, but for the dew drop, you need a macro lens so you can physically get closer and you know magnify the subject. So you need a macro lens and that will solve your purpose. Uh, if the wind is blowing, try to find a, a place where there's less wind and you'll get the shot. So you have to keep at it. It's not easy. You know, that to get that one image, you have to keep at it. The right time, the right moment, the right whatever. And as far as trees is concerned, I think there are ample nature photographers out there who are doing this. You know, so um, you'll need a wide angle lens and kind of dwell on the landscape mostly. Sir, I had another question. Yes. Have you ever clicked pictures of animals? And if you have, are clicking pictures of animals hard? Exceptionally and extremely hard. Yes, I have clicked photos of wildlife. I tried and um, I was helped by one of the finest uh, wildlife photographers in India, Dhritiman Mukherjee. And uh, this was in the run of Kutch where he, you know, helped photograph four day old wild foxes. We reached at nine in the morning outside the fox hole and it was till three o'clock till the mother fox was confident enough that we were not going to do anything and the pups started coming out. 
and that's when Vidyaman said, "Now you can start crawling like a snake towards the hole." And while doing that, I crawled over an ant hill. So you know what the story is. Uh, would you All right. A Nikon or a Canon? Um, okay, students. This is the last question, please. Hammer is a hammer. You just need to know how to use it. Can I um, ask something? Aaron, uh, I, I have a few points which I'd like to just point out, uh, Suganda. Yes. Right. Yes, absolutely. I was really looking forward to some closing remarks from your end. Okay, so uh, guys, uh, this question, if it was not going to come, the last question, I was anyways going to say that the question will always be there, which is the better camera, which is the better equipment. I'm going to give you the same answer my professor gave me. A hammer is a hammer, you need to know how to use it. So whichever camera, you just should know how to work the camera and get the shot. Um, owning the wrong equipment or a faulty equipment, that's not a anymore. Um, please understand that, you know, like I said before, it's a very subjective, um, art is very subjective. So it entirely depends on, um, you know, who are the people who are consuming your content and how they react to it. Just because someone says your work is not good or it's bad, it doesn't mean it is bad, you know. Just because you don't get enough likes, sorry, nowadays it's all about likes. If you don't get enough likes on Facebook or Instagram, doesn't mean your work is not good or your work is terrible of that sort, you know. It's just that whatever it is there for the it's a part and parcel of the of the, of the game um i think publication of content is super easy so for you guys at this day and age it's super easy to put your work out there and get noticed which was not there 10 15 years back it was the real struggle then um as is the access of information and knowledge you know youtube is there udemy is there a lot of these uh, universities are giving free courses in photography and media definitely jump on it um, access to decent equipment, like, you know, cell phones having 20, 30 megapixels, that's very easy. And every three months, there's a new cell phone, which comes up with, you know, something more fancy in terms of the camera equipment. So you always will get cutting edge. And what I think is more fascinating in the coming times is that Google is now shifting with uh, what we call a computational photography, where the the ai is going to aid to get better results with the photos so it's i i can't even fathom what they are going to do with it so it's just phenomenal kind of stuff which we are looking forward to do. um what i would say is uh passion definitely plays uh, a very important goal in this if you're not going to be passionate about a subject anything you know art math science whatever uh, it is that you work on if you don't enjoy it, it's absolutely no point in wasting your time on it. You know, um, please take risks just because you fail once doesn't mean it's the end of the world. That's the beauty about the whole thing is taking risk. And that is, I think what makes it very exciting. So for me, I think, uh, I kind of dwell on the fact that it's challenging for me. If it's challenging, then it gets more exciting. You know, if it's just something that just, Oh yeah, you just go in there and you finish it off and your job is done. It's like, that's kind of boring. Um, I graduated, I left school. I wouldn't say graduated. Graduated is a wrong word. I'll tell you why. I left school in 2005. It's been 15 years. I'm still studying. I'm still doing courses online. So I don't think I've graduated. Every once in a while, I feel, okay, I need to learn something new with photography. I need to learn this. I need to learn that. So I'm always learning. And the learning is not limited to books or university. It could be, you know, doing workshops online or listening to people or interacting with them or going and kind of doing a hands-on workshop. And the intention is very simple. I need to go and learn something. I'll go and learn something. It, I really don't care what they think of me or whether I know more than the person or not. It's just that I don't know what they're teaching and I need to learn that. So always please exercise your brain muscle. Always keep upgrading yourself. Um, Self-belief is something that we can talk a lot about, but have a little faith in yourself. Um, you've reached so far and with whatever knowledge and whatever your abilities are, you've reached so far and celebrate where you are because that's a success in itself. Um, I think uh, one of the biggest uh, takeaways that is there 
with everybody else and i think uh, this is a conundrum which all of us face and when i say all of us i'm talking about me you i'm talking about you know even uh, your parents or whoever you know i'm just giving you a very broad uh, summation of what i think is the underlying that one underlying factor to everything i think in every situation we have two choices and there are only two choices the choice is between uh, looking good and doing the right thing that is your choice at all decision making your choice is either to look good or to do the right thing so let's assume for a moment that right now in this discussion i see there are 48 people including myself so 47 i'm i can assure you that there are there have been some questions that the students have thought about asking me but they did not because they were like what if everybody laughs at me or what are other people going to think about me they might have even thought that i would laugh or what would i think about that question but the fact of the matter is that if you'd asked the question you would have been wiser and there is never a stupid question so you know the choice is always doing the right thing and looking good you know that's how i always uh, keep it for myself i mean i i live by that and that's what i always tell people and uh lastly i'd say there's a very fine line between uh, uh bravery and foolishness so with photography you see a lot of people creating content online you get very swayed by someone who's climbed a tall building or at the edge of some cave and you know hanging out of it you know the weird stuff you see on the internet you know hanging out from the car like i don't even want to talk about all the stuff i'm sure you guys know like you know diving in the water with the uh, without any um, you know equipment in front of sharks and what not hey, there's a fine line between foolishness and bravery so don't push it because it just takes you know that that fine line to cross over it takes very quickly and then the results are really really horrific so i mean be safe yes uh, you know be brave about how you do it but let's not push our luck you know it's just not worth it um, it's not worth it so that's all um, i think i have uh, pretty much in terms of you know the pointers that i'd share other than that i mean i'm well you're welcome to reach out to me and i'd help you with the best i can so all right thank you uh, students for your questions and uh, thank you rahul uh, some of the very well made points i must say i particularly thought that you know that thin line between bravery and foolishness i think it's very important that uh, our young students realize that so uh, yes thank you so much for taking out time and